to welcome everyone. It's a start time o'clock here. So I wanted to thank you all for joining us uh, for this full day webinar in diseases of honeybees. Uh, the overwhelming number of registrants uh, are proving the importance of covering this topic in our lectures uh, that we provided with the Dave Thompson Foundation. Today's webinar is a special uh, webinar, a part of a special program that the Davis Thompson Foundation is bringing to you in support of important environmental and social causes. Uh, last week, we hosted Black Voices in Pathology. Today, we have just a webinar in diseases of honeybees. And in February, we'll be hosting a webinar on coral diseases. So make sure you sign up for that one too. I am Rafaela Dinegri, okay. and I'll be monitoring today's webinar along with Laura Fetiu and Eileen Henderson. Before I'll start, I'll go over some guidelines for this webinar. So please pay attention and follow the guidelines so we can keep the lecture following orderly. Your audio and video are going to be turned off to avoid noise and distractions. You may ask questions for the speaker during the presentation via the Q&A box that you'll find on the bottom of your screen. Please make sure your questions are related to the topic covered. Questions will be curated to avoid repetition and will be left to the presenter to address them at the end of the presentation time alone. You may use the chat box for any comments that you might have, but your questions for the speaker should go in the Q&A box. When you use the chat box, make sure you change the setting for attendees and panelists so everybody can see your comment. At the end of the presentation, we'll ask for feedback via a link to a questionnaire that will be sent to you via email and it will also be uh, on the chat box. Please take a moment to respond. Your feedback is very important and will help us improve the webinars. Today's lecture is going to be broadcasted for a limited time on the Foundation's YouTube channel and Facebook page. And you'll find them within a week or so. Uh, we'll be posting those links in the chat box as well. Without further ado, I'll introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Elamir Simko. Elamir obtained his DVM degree in 1990 from University of Belgrade, Yugoslavia and Doctor of Veterinary Science degree in 1998 from Ontario Veterinary College at University of Guelph, Canada. Since 1998, he has been a faculty member in the Department of Veterinary Pathology, Western College of Veterinary Medicine, involved in teaching, diagnostics, and research. Recently, he established a honeybee health research and teaching program at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine. He has received three awards for teaching excellence and two awards for research excellence. Dr. Simco, it's over to you. Thank you, Rafaela. Uh, and welcome to everybody. Uh, it's a big surprise uh, uh, to a certain extent that we have such a big audience there. I hope that uh, all of you are well and uh, healthy not only you, but yours, uh, your dearest. And I am assured by development of vaccines and that the light at the end of the tunnel is there. And let's hope that uh, all of these things is going to be over. I, I want to thank uh, uh, Davis Thompson Foundation for inviting my research and teaching group to present these seminars. Uh, and a special thanks to moderator and uh, organizing committee who made this uh, entire uh, adventure very, very easy and smooth. So uh, uh, I hope we don't disappoint you. Uh, and if anybody is going to disappoint you, it's going to be me, but my students are excellent and I'm sure you'll be impressed with their, with their presentations. Okay, so this, this seminar is slightly different than, than, than many uh, other seminars, not all, but many other seminars delivered by uh, uh, Davis Thompson Foundation. It's uh, uh, geared towards diseases and specifically it's geared to non-mammalian species, to honeybees. And uh, as you can see, there is a, a pathology slide of uh, longitudinal section of honeybees 
but we will not be speaking a lot about histopathology with certain exceptions for certain diseases. <clears throat> so uh, uh, before I go ahead, I want to thank to many, many funding agencies without whom this program would not exist and we would not be delivering this seminar. Uh, 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 our gratitude or specifically my personal gratitude because I use it a lot goes to internet and Google images. And uh, many of the images that I use are from internet. Uh, rem a reminder, we just started, well, just five years ago to work with bees many of images and diseases we fortunately didn't have in our apiary so we had to find them at the uh, on internet we acknowledge a source of images by url address uh, and we are profoundly thankful to the authors and to the sites i hope that this sincere acknowledgement is sufficient uh, however if it is not I will be burning an eternal file for stealing them. And uh, I guess, uh, but for now, I cannot change it. They are here. And another big thank you to all presenters that are member of Western College of Honeybee Health Research Lab. And you'll hear them. Uh, all of them are actually veterinarians, except Igor Medici, who is a biologist. And actually he's leaving in February to Germany, to Bas. We got ecotoxicologist position there, but the rest are pathologists. And you may wonder how pathologists are uh, became involved in honeybees. You give me knife, you give me a cow, and I'm more most comfortable in necropsy. And if lesion is very obvious like this one, hopefully I'll be able to give you even diagnosis. So how come that we are here with honeybee diseases? Well, I, I'll. I often use this quote that is anonymous quote, but is used. It was used by toxicologists in our department, Bruno Schiffer. So, I consider myself not an expert in honeybee diseases. We started to work on them, research them. I've been hobbyist for many, many years, but at the same time, not an expert. But in veterinary profession, specifically in North America, there are not too many veterinarians who are comfortable with honeybee diseases. So when I speak about land of blind, I refer specifically to veterinary profession and not to provincial and state apiculturist or apiaries on inspector or honeybee entomologists who are experts in these uh, areas who could deliver much better lectures and uh, focus on diseases than I will ever be able to do. So all the credits goes to these people who keep our bees currently healthy in North America. And it's been like that for 100 years, at least, uh, even longer. In Saskatchewan, it's 100 years. We have provincial apiculture. In some other states, it's uh, longer. So they are serving the role of veterinarians and pathologists in honeybees. These things have changed. Uh, recently because of introduction of uh, 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 policies by FDA and by Canada Health. So in 2015, how did we start? Sarah Wood was looking for a project. She just came from, she finished DVM degree a few years before that and came back to do residency. She wanted a project. And somehow uh, I said, we don't have money. I don't know how to do research in honeybees, but I am beekeeper and I'd be happy to explore. So in 2015, uh, there were only three people working on bees and uh, Joanna was visiting us from, from Calgary there. 2017, we started to grow 18, even more, 19 more and 20. It surprised all of us and certainly me. I'm honored to be part of this group. We started also as these changes were introduced to, to uh, uh, policy changes regarding uh, medically important antimicrobial use. We started to do honeybee course elective in third year uh, and in 2017, 18, and sometimes in Saskatchewan, when we do this course in April, we still have uh, uh, snow. And I will be soon starting with the course. I just want to also indicate we are 
very involved in uh, continuing education uh, uh, delivered to, through many different associations, as well as most recently, and the most successful through the Davis Thompson Foundation that we have over 1000 registered. So thank you. So how come this high interest? This is a survey by uh, National Geographic and question, I'm not sure whether you can read, hopefully you can. If you could dedicate your life to saving one species, which would you choose? Which species would it be? And honeybees are by far overrepresented, double over elephants. When we don't do research during the summer, we occasionally go in and fish and all of these people over the last five years were directly involved in research in honeybees. Some of them were technicians, summer students, uh, visiting students, visiting scientists. So now a bit about this seminar. It is targeted to veterinary profession, uh, DVM pathologists, uh, vet technicians. No background is needed. We will start from scratch, from very scratch. I'm aware that some of uh, our audience are beginner or intermediate level beekeepers, and I believe it will be beneficial for you. If you are a provincial or state inspector apiculturist, there is nothing that you can learn here, but your feedback and input will be very, very useful. And if you're a commercial beekeeper, I also suspect you should know all these because as I mentioned, we're starting from the uh, base, no background is needed. So we'll be build, building up. And uh, we've done that a lot and uh, specifically for, for veterinary profession. And I also taught this course, as I said, and the biggest struggle and biggest gap that we need to uh, fill today will be normal biology beekeeping uh, of honeybees. We are used to think about bee diseases. We have this skeleton in our head, etiology, pathogenesis, diagnosis, treatment prevention, ancillary tests. However, when it comes to the, uh, to, to, to the uh, uh, biology management practices and many of disease will originate from there, we need to understand that. And usually I dedicate around uh, uh, 10 hours of lectures only on that and videos. Unfortunately, we don't have this lec uh, uh, lecture here. So we cut those 10 hours to two hours or two and a half. And uh, we have also diseases that are more or less the same length, slightly, slightly uh, uh, cut down. So I will not be dwelling on outcomes, but basically by the end, you should be familiar with bee biology, bee practices, uh, beekeeping practices. You should know more or less about uh, uh, as I mentioned, etiology, pathogenesis, diagnosis of major diseases, how to diagnose them. You, you should be able to, to feel comfortable that you can diagnose most of them because for many of them, ancillary tests we use only as confirmation. So basically confirm positive. I'm pretty sure I know what's going on. It's confirm positive or even better confirm negative if I want to rule out some very hot and nasty disease. Okay, so uh, an overview of biology and specific focus on, on, on uh, diseases and control and spread. So just quickly from biology uh, 101, as you know, Eucaria, Animalia, Arthropoda, Insecta, Hymenoptera, and Apide, Apis, Mellifera. Apis, Mellifera is basically Western honeybees. We will go slightly through these, Arthropoda, it's easy for pathologists and veterinarian arthritis. Arthritis is arthros, so joined legs, and pododermatitis. Podo is basically legs, so joined legs. Insects, insectus from Latin comes uh, that it's insected, segmented. So insects have segmented three parts of the body, head, thorax, and abdomen, and attached to the thorax, there are three pairs of legs. Hymenoptera, is hymen, membrane, epteros, pterae, are wings from uh, uh, hymen is uh, fr from the Greek 
So basically membranous wings. Bees, they have long tongue, body hair, and hair is split at the end. And many people mix bees with wasps. There are around 20,000 species of bees worldwide. In North America, we have over 3,000. However, only a few are uh, social bees. So now insects, we have over 900,000 species of insects. We have only 70,000 vertebrate species. Estimated though, that there are 2 million to 30 million undescribed or not described insects. So if you're a scientist, you want to pump papers out about new insects, you want to be entomologist. It is largest animal biomass by far. Quintillion individual insect alive. I didn't know what it means, but I believe that after this pandemic, all world countries will be quintillion dollars in depth. I'm not sure. Uh, so here it is, a uh, population of honeybees and uh, a population, number of insects and number of people. Now, very interesting and very, very important for our topic is 900 species of insects. Only 2% are, only 2 are uh, uh, social insects. And those are colonial bees, wasps, termites. However, these 2% are 50% of insect biomass. Amazing, why? Because they have this efficiency of survival and competition. And Edward O. Wilson, they call him also Darwin of the 21st century, dedicated entire his career on social insects, uh, uh, Harvard professor emeritus. And he characterized social insects as the reproductive division of labor. So basically males do one thing, females do another thing, certain uh, caste division. Cooperative brood care, everybody take care about the, the, the brood youngsters. Overlapping generations, teenagers don't leave homes. They stay and contribute to the, to the benefit of the colony and they will be able and willing to die for it. So if you look at other species, if you take leghorn, we say that it is very productive. It produces one egg a day, which is 55 grams. An leghorn hen is around two, two and a half kilograms. It's 2.2% of body weight everyday production. Jersey cow, milk, 4.5%. Uh, some dairy, dairy goats, 8.5%. A queen, it is 200 milligram weight. It produces during the peak season, 1,500, 1,500 to 2,000 eggs. Each egg is 15 milligrams. It is over 100 body weight. It produces every day in form of eggs because it is highly specialized. It doesn't do anything. Queen does only two things, lay eggs and produce pheromones. And pheromones are magic substance that enchant entire colony to bow to her and to feed certain uh, bees and they feeding the, her constantly and rest are ready to die for the colony. Another very, very fascinating fact about uh, social insects and specifically about bees, Carl von Frisch, uh, uh, born in Austro-Hungary from the same territory more or less where where I was, um, uh, where I came from, my ancestors, except that he was born in Vienna, he's Austrian German. He studied entire life bagel dance, basically. He figured out how bees communicate about the, uh, the, the, the pasture. So based on orientation of the sun and based on uh, the uh, uh, distance of the flowers, they will dance, they will make these eight figures and the length of this dance, uh, this figure here, when they, when they waggle their, their tail, uh, will, it will indicate the distance between hive and flower, one, one second, one kilometer. The vigor of the dancing will be the abundance and the angle 
between the sun and the flower will be uh, basically where it is oriented uh, so other bees can find it. So other bees are following this dancer and memorizing the location. And now just again, this is last example for the outstanding and fascinating efficiency and marvel of honeybees. Uh, well, uh, the, these bees are the only animal species that we can decode where they ate. Pathologists may say, well, we disagree. We can open a cow from a, a rumen from a cow and we know what she ate. That's correct, but we don't know where she ate it unless obviously there is a fence. So we know where, where was it. So when we change the task, B task into human equivalent value or, uh, and, and we start to think what these bees are committing by, by, by these dance and convinced to do, they are able to run 180 kilometers an hour. They will find a town that is around 100 kilometers away. And they will find around this town specific nectar field. And they will drink 30 to 40 liters. If you're like me, that you're 100 kilos, you will drink 30 to 40 liters of this nectar. And with this big belly, you'll be running back 100 kilometers to hive. You will be regurgitating this nectar. And guess what? You thought that is everything? You do it 10 times before sunset, or probably even more if field is closer. Speak about exhaustion, similar to veterinary practitioners, I guess. Well, just to finish about quickly uh, about few uh, different species uh, of, uh, 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 of bees. We have open area dwellers and closed cavity dwellers. And uh, honeybees are in the closed cavities. And we have two specific uh, species that are managed for, for honey uh, Apis carnica, uh, so, sorry, Apis serena indica and Apis mellifera. Serena indica is in the Eastern Asian countries. Uh, Apis mellifera is basically all over the world, but basically it's Western European bee that was spread by, by uh, settlers and colonization. And it's much more uh, productive uh, honeybee. And now Apis mellifera has several subspecies and one of them is this African bee. African bee that is very aggressive and very protective and uh, Igor Medici will be speaking about it. It was transferred into uh, Brazil uh, for research and after that spread to entire uh, uh, southern or central portion of, of uh, Americas. Uh, but you'll hear story about that. The major uh, honeybee species are Italian Carniolian in North America. There are dark bees uh, uh, in uh, uh, Germany and Central Europe and some Russian bees, uh, Caucasian bees. Uh, those are being, uh, have, have been imported to, to United States for improved genetics and to resist to diseases specifically to Varroa. We'll cover that briefly later on. So let's just go now to history. Well, for many, many years and millennia, human species figure out that honey is actually sweet. And later on, probably male part of human species figure out that they can brew it and make mead. And what they did, they hunted honey. And here we have an example, human hanging from a cliff, trying to steal this honey. Bees are flying. And this, this painting is 8,000 years in Spain. And when you look close, you look diameter of the shoulders and diameter of the hip from the pathologists, from biology, it must be woman. And where are the men? Well, somehow men figure out how to send women to the most difficult task. Men are sitting somewhere here and drinking mead or beer that brewed through, from, from this. Uh, Egyptians are first known to start beekeeping. And uh, they had this, uh, uh, 
dirt dishes that uh, formed and and they 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 were able to uh, domestic domesticate if you wish and uh, uh, honeybees and uh, later on uh, the oldest apiary was found uh, that is around thousand years in Israel and this apiary is most likely dating towards kings or uh, uh, King David's or King Solomon apiary and it arguable that uh, with the uh, uh, when when Israelites left Egypt they brought their skills beekeeping skills and we can see they have much bigger hives here uh, uh, and uh, obviously they perfected it much better Roman apiary Romans also had it uh, a station apiary and later on through the next 3,000 years from the Egyptian until recently, until 100 years ago, slightly more, we are always dealing with stationary and non removable frames, and we needed to destroy at least partially hive in order to harvest the, the honey. And this happened to be the main uh, uh, beekeeping uh, uh, practices in Europe preserved by monasteries predominantly and perfected by monasteries. North American or American uh, preacher or minister, Lorenzo Langstroth designed removable hive, removable frames. And these frames, uh, he, he discovered this B space, which is three eighths of the inch. He, he figured out that if there is space only three eighths parallel space bees are not going to fill it and this is a Hoffman frame uh, that has these uh, spacers here that assures that there is this three eighths of the space and we can go and create uh, these removable frames in Langstroth hive and majority of the beekeeping operations specifically commercial beekeeping operations in North America are Langstroth. There are some others in Europe and there are some other in North America, but those are certainly superior ones. And in Canada, at least, uh, uh, but I suspect in, in many states in the United States, frames have to be removable because we uh, want to make sure that apiculture, uh, apiculturists or inspectors or right now veterinarians can remove frames and inspect for disease. Uh, the frame has a foundation, uh, and this could be either wax with imprinted hexagonal cells, or it could be plastic that is covered by wax. And predominantly North American commercial operations is plastic covered by wax. In Europe, uh, people are predominantly using the uh, uh, wax foundations. And this is basically this plastic wax and these are going to draw out. That's basically the term, beekeeping term. We are starting to use, develop terminology for veterinary profession to deal with beekeepers. Drawing out the wax from foundation. So they are building these hexagonal cells that will be storing in them honey and or will be developing, uh, laying eggs and developing, uh, developing uh, bees there. So, Terminology, we finish with the frame, cover. Uh, commercial beekeepers usually have only one cover, but uh, 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 hobby beekeeper, bee, beekeepers sometimes have two covers. After that, we have honey super. Super is a box filled with frames and majority of Langstroth have 10 frames. There are some eight frames. And uh, hobbies would have sh uh, shallower super compared to this one that is deep uh, because this thing is damn heavy when it's filled with, with, with honey. If it is deep super with honey, three kilograms each is 30 kilograms plus extra wood, you have to carry heavy. So, so people sometimes uh, go with shorter one. Uh, the, uh, the commercial beekeepers have all of them the same because it's much easier for management. Queen excluder is placed between honey supers and brood chamber. 
and brood chamber is in brood chamber is queen and queen is larger than worker bees and she cannot go through the queen excluder which is basically a simple mesh that will allow worker bees that are smaller to go through and deposit honey but queen cannot go up neither drones and she can uh, she cannot lay eggs there so she lays eggs and brood is going to be in brood chamber and now a bit of difference for uh, uh, areas where we are in cold tem temperate Canada uh, prairies, we have two brood chambers because over the winter, they need a lot of food stores to survive. And screen bottom boards, we can speak about this when we speak varroa, but basically this is the bottom board where bees are entering the hive. Terminology will continue. So hive is basically this this wooden structure. It's a cavity. It's a hollow tree where, where bees, where, where colony lives. And colony consists of queen, drones, and workers. So this is the colony lives in hive. If we have small replacement colony, replacement heifers for veterinarians, it's called nucleus. And colony naturally swarms through swarm. Uh, rep, uh, reproduced through swarms, swarming. However, in beekeeping, we don't want bees swarm because we will lose half of our population. Just imagine you lose half of your dairy herd. Uh, where is your milk coming from? So how beekeeper do, they, they, they figure out how to uh, replicate them and they'll cover that quickly uh, uh, through nucleus uh, formation and basically replacement heifers. Smoker is our friend. It will calm down the bees. It will break the uh, uh, alarm pheromone. Hive tool is used for prying and pulling out of the frames because these frames will be propolicized and stuck to each other. Brush, sometimes we use it, and gloves avail. Uh, great majority of beekeepers uh, would use it and gloves depending beginners and uh, commercial if it's, they need to do very fast, they cannot be uh, uh, careful, uh, they have all the protection. However, there are beekeepers who don't use it and this is specifically uh, those that have uh, good selection uh, and this is a, a selectable characteristic, peacefulness. And this is an example of Kelt uh, I met him at the conferences. He's very known a uh, breeder of uh, back fast uh, uh, bees. He uh, that he learned from uh, brother Adams. Uh, uh, this is a very very known uh, 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 sub species or whatever we call it. Yeah, I, I, uh, professionals would probably correct me here. Okay, since. My understanding is that we have many, many people here, and I don't know where you are geographically located. And beekeeping is tremendously influenced by geography, by climate, by surrounding. Even one yard from the another yard will differ, uh, specifically if it is slightly more distant based on uh, flora, based on uh, uh, geography, uh, and and if it is further based on climate. So majority of our presentation will be focused on the Canadian prairies and it will involve similar, similar uh, practices in uh, North, Uni North Central United States where realistically there are great, great majority of beehives there. The biggest commercial beekeepers in the world are here are here and in Alberta, in, in, in neighboring neighboring province here. So just keep in mind that when we, when we speak here and students are speaking, uh, that we sometimes forget that you may be located somewhere else. And for us, summer may be different term than for you in Australia or somewhere else, okay? And winter, vice versa. Or regulatory policies, we have different ref, re, regulatory policies, even between Canada and United States. Some drugs are approved, some not. And specifically, big difference between European Union and North America. So 
keep in mind those uh, things, uh, those variations. <clears throat> and good beekeeper will know about those and they will know, okay, this yard is bes beside the river and they will have this flow versus this yard is in the heavy agriculture and they it will have this flow. Okay, so, so now specifically for the Western uh, prairies, uh, how, uh, and, and because we'll be referring to this terminology and, and a similar appearance would be and, and structures also North United States. So we have two brood chambers, as I mentioned, so instead of one brood chamber, we have two brood chambers and on top could be queen excluder, but not all beekeepers use it. Four hives are per pallet. Pallet, just regular commercial transportation pallet. The uh, four hives fit perfectly on that pallet. We can buy it very cheap. Uh, because it's surplus and we can use uh, in commercial operations, forklift, we can lift all four hives at the same time and work them. A yard is usually composed of, of 10 to 12 to 20 pallets up to 50 hives. However, if the, uh, the floral is, the flora is not very abundant, it could be only half, 25, if you want to have a uh, very abundant uh, uh, forage. It's, uh, again, this could vary from, from not, not even from geography to geography, even 50 kilometers apart will vary. Uh, yards would be distance uh, four to five miles, ideally even more, because flight radius of a bee in tents is up to two miles, which is three kilometers. And most commercial operation in Saskatchewan would be between 500 and 5,000. Alberta would be about that, up 10, 15, 20, 25. North United States, states uh, 40,000, 50,000, 100,000. And if I have there European beekeepers, and I was, I came from Europe, uh, my accent, I should have told you, I am Ukrainian, born in Yugoslavia, and came to. Canada uh, during the crazy Balkan War, last Balkan War. Uh, so uh, for us, to a beekeeper could leave from 50, 50 to 100 hives. It was already, you can make a decent income <clears throat> or supplemental income to you. Here, you're speaking about 100,000 hives. Amazing. Those are on the very biggest, biggest side. So here is the radius. So that's the basically intense uh, uh, foraging, but closer to hive is going to be more intense, remember, because honeybees has a shorter uh, way to uh, fly and go back and make, make more turns. When we move hives from one, from one uh, yard to another, we should not overlap flight zone because bees will remember based on orienteers where they are, orientation flights and they will go here and they will return right to the same hive. You move this hive 100 meters, they will not find it. They will go right at this spot where hive was. So when you're moving hives, it always needs to be more than five miles, ideally 10, uh, uh, so there is no overlap. Uh, the, uh, and again, the one to the other adjacent yards ideally would be that we don't have overlap, but in commercial operations quite often we have periphery overlap of the flights. It is relevant to honeybee uh, and disease transfer. So this is a typical yard pallet for four uh, hives. And this happened to be a fall, as you can see, uh, yellow trees there. And we have buckets on top with Honey syrup, we are giving them sugar syrup because we stole probably high supers high, high supers high, sorry, five supers high here, around 100 kilos we stole from them. And instead of honey, we give them sugar. Here is one of our research apiary. Uh, this one is populated slightly more because we are not after the honey collection. So we have this. Uh, one, two, three, and right now we have a yard even here, but Google Map didn't catch it. Another yard is in the city, 
This one is more like a yard. Uh, and here is Western College, here is Saskatoon, here is our uh, research yard, yard. And if I ever complain, here is my house. So one research JP, uh, my home across the road, I should not complain. I really have an ideal job. So let's just speak a bit about uh, B uh, practices. So how do we extract honey? So here is an example. You saw when, when bees were throwing foundation from the wax uh, uh, foundation, wax from the foundation, and these here, these cells are now filled with honey and capped with honey. So this capping is basically wax. So when nectar is around 40%, 40 to 70% of, uh, of the humidity, it's brought to the hive, it's processed uh, by various enzymes, invertase, and, and dehydrated to less than 18% of the humidity and when it is less than 18%, honeybees are covering with wax and, and preserve from the uh, penetration of the humidity and this honey can last forever. Uh, and this is literally, I was told uh, or heard somewhere that from pyramids, there was hermetically uh, uh, preserved honey and opened and it was still edible. I wouldn't eat it, I guess, but uh, it had still characteristics. Hopefully that's inf correct information. Nevertheless, it is correct that this honey will last four years. If by any chance we extract honey that is, uh, has higher humidity than 18 percent, it needs to be dehydrated. And if it is not dehydrated, it will start ferment and as you can see in this container, it will start to blow, produce gas, and this honey is not good for, for consumption as for example, this one. What we do in order to extract, uh, we need to scratch this uh, capping to open these cells. We put these frames in the uh, centrifugal uh, honey extractor. This is a hobby honey extractor, three frames slightly bigger extractor that is probably 36 or 48 frames that is radial circular and even bigger horizontal extractors. This is uh, 60 frames, I it looks like. We have 30 frames here and 30 here. Uh, we have also 180 frames, 66, uh, yeah, 180, 30, 30, 30, 30 uh, for some big commercial operation. Okay, so now a bit about Honeybee industry. This is the Canadian number of honeybees. Here is a, a Second World War, and we have significant increase in honeybee colonies in Canada and all over the world. And uh, older people would probably know why, because we had shortage of sugar, and it was uh, very good, very good economic income. And and. Quite often, number of honeybees are related to the price of honeybee. Uh, 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 number of honeybee colonies is closely related to the price of honey. However, sometimes we can detect also drops in the number of honeybees related to diseases. And this here drop in 1980s and early 1990s is most likely due to introduction of Varroa to North America, but not only Varroa. Another uh, uh, agent, Nozima, ap Nozima apis, is we know about that forever, well, forever, since uh, 1900 was described by German biologists, but Nozima serrana, that remember apis serrana is uh, or uh, in uh, Apis serena indica, uh, Eastern Asian, there is a jump from, from that uh, uh, subspecies, Nozima serena came into Apis mellifera. Similar varroa jumped from the same species into Apis. And when it came to population, naive population, we have sudden drop. And later on over years, we have recovery. 
during the same period of time, we have also introduction of neonicotinoids. So we have three new things happening here. And to what extent each stressor contributed to the uh, sudden decline of the colony, it's disputable and uh, 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 very much between scientists, policymaker, industry. But probably there is mixture of these. I don't have a chart for United States uh, for the, uh, right after the Second World War, but I have since 1987, exactly the time when varroa mite was first detected in United States, introduced, and we see sudden reduction. So from three million, three and a half million, go to two and a half million. And, and in the United States, it's recovering slowly, but still not even close to three and a half million as it was before Varroa, Nozima, Apis, and Neonicotinoids. Now, economics, <clears throat> why do beekeepers keep bees? Well, most of beekeepers keep bee because of economic income or because of honey or a few of them are because of their environmentalists and want to preserve pollinators. But major income comes from honey, pollen, propolis, and royal jelly. Uh, production of nucleuses, replacement hives, pick, uh, packages, which are also replacement. It's uh, bee with, uh, a queen bee with bees. And queens also are big business. However, the biggest contribution of beekeepers to the economy is through pollination. Uh, honey bees are the most common agricultural pollinators. Uh, three quarters of crops need animal pollination and one third of global production depends on the animal pollinators. And 80% of animal pollinators are honey bees. Uh, bee contributes $20 billion to US agriculture. Two and a half million hives of total colonies in the United States we saw after decline. And two thirds of these are migratory beekeeping that are going, uh, 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 that are, uh, I have some kind of uh, a chat here that it shows here. Uh, and I cannot follow, so I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, hopefully I can just go ahead. The uh, two thirds of uh, total bee uh, colonies in United States are basically migratory. They are taken all around United States for the pollination. These and uh, uh, there are approximately hundred thousand beekeepers and 160 million of pounds produced in in United States of honey, but 370, two times as much or even more are imported uh, to United States. Importance of pollinators, 90% of blueberries and cherries would uh, depend on honeybee pollination and 100% of almond production. Uh, which is almost a million acres in California. And United States is the largest producers and exporters of blueberries and almonds. Let's go closer. Let's go, I know what you're waiting for, diseases. But I'll still have to hold you there. Diseases in honeybees are consequence of the environmental management, genetic infectious, viral, bacterial, fungal, protozoal, mites, you name it, pests, poisoning, the same the same as any other species. However, what is difference? It's difference biology and normal development and beekeeping. And if we don't know what normal is, we cannot diagnose what abnormal is. That's why in first year we learn normal anatomy and histology and physiology and all these OGs in order to be able to start to learn pathology and microbiology and all these nasty OGs. So we need to learn normal. Here it is normal. Here, these two books, and it's very dangerous to recommend book to international audience. 
uh, there is always risk that I will not, and due to my ignorance, I will not recommend some excellent textbooks. But I can say it's safe for me to say, say that these two books I recommend to our uh, students in my course because they're, first of all, they are thin and they have a lot of pictures. So that's great. There are a lot of websites and unfortunately internet is a great thing but unfortunately so sorry fortunately internet is a great thing but unfortunately there is a lot of misinformation there and 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 we need to uh, be able to to distinguish those and i i listed here some sites that are highly reputable and highly recommended randy oliver scientific beekeeper this is amazing website, an amazing beekeeper. I met him, Trem great person. Uh, Paul Kelly has a run from University of Guelph. He has uh, great videos. Uh, BMAT has uh, is is a relatively uh, small website uh, indicating about bee diseases and symptoms, and it needs still a lot of improvement. We use in course actually some sections of, of videos uh, made by Keith Delaplane, a professor in uh, from Georgia University, and uh, uh, its connection here. It's made 30 years, 40 years probably ago. Uh, at that time, Keith was still young, uh, but uh, uh, it's very useful video. There are some things that we don't do anymore, or some treatment that we don't, uh, some terminology potentially, but Bees, essentially, bee biology doesn't change, and beekeeping has not changed much. For 3,000 years, up to uh, Lorenzo Langstroth was very similar, and from Lorenzo Langstroth, rem uh, discovery of the Langstroth hive up to now, it's not much different. Okay, uh, there are some free uh, a free access, and if you have your 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 telephone, you can just capture these screens with these uh, links. And I am pretty sure these uh, seminars are recorded and going to be posted at uh, uh, Davis Thompson Foundation website, YouTube website, so you can go back to these. And here is another American free site and uh, post, uh, prepared by AVMA, and very similar to it, but I believe much higher quality is this USDA module uh, uh, that is also available for free. I would not buy this book. I'm not recommending it. However, it is extremely good book as a reference book, but not necessarily as a starter book. So basically, if you wish comparative, it would be a JKP uh, for pathology, uh, veterinary pathology, this is JKP for honeybees, specifically for biology. So we spoke about different castes and division of labor, social insects. So bees, uh, bee colonies composed of workers, drones, and queens. Drone here is probably depicted a bit fatter than it is, but it depends. They vary with size. Sometimes they are such big but uh, sometimes they are not as big, but still bigger than these and, and, and shorter than, than uh, queen. So worker and queen are deployed. They have exactly the same genetics, 32 chromosome. It is fertilized egg, except that when egg is laid, worker is fed only short time with royal jelly. And after that, he get worker, brood food feed, and it will develop into worker. You could use it as phenotypic castration. It's not necessarily castration. It just, you, uh, the worker is not allowed to develop the uh, reproductive system that is developed, female reproductive system that is developed in, in the queens, from the same egg, if queen, larvae are fed abundant royal jelly. So that's the only difference between workers and queens. There, is a, there are 
20 to 80,000 workers in colony. And in some regions, 80,000 will not reach. But in our regions, we have very big colonies because we have very short uh, 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 honey uh, harvest time. And 20,000, they will decrease from summer to winter 20,000. Summer worker will live six weeks. Winter workers will live five months. And all activities in hives are performed by female fertile worker bees. Queen opposite to workers has the same diploid genetics. However, it is fed royal jelly and development from egg to emergence is only 16 days versus here, here we have 21 days. There, are, there is only one queen per colony. There are some exceptions, uh, double queen and these, but we'll not be confusing this seminar with. And queen leaves three to five years. However, efficient beekeeping and specifically during the last 20, 30 years or 20 years, uh, the duration of the life of queens decrease and a recommended replacement between two and three years. Some have to replace even every year. Uh, it is complicated and multifactorial. And again, uh, lack of scientific consensus was going on. There are only two most important tasks that queen does, lay eggs and we saw how efficient she is and she produces pheromones uh, that uh, this magic potion that keep colony enchanted and, and, and uh, uh, listen to, to her majesty and serves to the colony. Drones are present only during the summer and they are haploid. They are non uh, origin originate from non-fertilized eggs. They are developing for 24 days. Uh, they are fed uh, similar to workers, uh, initially a bit of royal jelly, but then uh, uh, bee bread, pollen, uh, nectar mixed and with, with some uh, uh, gland secretions. There are between 300 and 1,000 drones in colony and a healthy colony will have, uh, will have a good population of drones. And even though people think the drones are uh, only for, for mating, uh, they do contribute to, to uh, uh, health and well-being of colony. We just don't know all, all aspects. The main function of drone is reproduction. So here is just repeat of the same queen lay eggs, uh, larva during the six days, and we have pre-pupa and pupa, and at 21 days, worker bees will emerge. Here is the worker bees emerging 21 days, 24 and 16. Whenever I have these sick bees, uh, sick bee here uh, as a as an image, it means that it's important from the disease point of view. And here, particularly, this length of the development of a larvae and pupae, and that it's longer in drones, is important for specifically varroa because varroa enters reproductive stage in this cup root. And if it is longer, it will have more reproductive cycles or more uh, mites will mature and uh, higher infectivity will happen. So uh, here is another just depiction of, of the, of the uh, various stage uh, uh, development, but what we have here, we have different uh, uh, stages of brood. So this is egg and egg, uh, uh, this is early larva C, and here we have medium stage larva, late larva, and we have capped, brood that is pupa. This is actually abnormal, abnormal brood. And it's here because I can capture within a few square uh, uh, inches, multiple different stages of brood, which is abnormal. It shouldn't be like that. It should be synchronized. Like here, we have all brood the same age, all cap brood. It means that colony is healthy all eggs at the same time versus here, something is happening, either queen or we have mortality of the larvae, uh, 
early abortion situation and removal of the dead and put inputs new eggs there. Okay, so again, capped, uh, capped brood and open brood, and we'll come back to examination of those. So synchronized uh, is, that's normal, this is abnormal. The same, normal, abnormal. Now, just quickly about these three cast queens. So this is the only mated female bee. However, there could be other female bee that lay eggs. So queen is not the only that lay eggs. Worker bee can lay eggs, but cannot lay fertilize eggs because it doesn't have spermatica and doesn't have developed reproductive tract because remember it was castrated by uh, nutritional deprivation, if you wish. Versus queen has all reproductive tract and uh, it is mated and worker doesn't is not mated when it develops into pseudo queen, we'll cover it later. Sorry for introducing that and confusing you, but it will be clear by the end of the today, hopefully. So only mated egg laying female uh, with developed reproductive tract that can uh, uh, lay fertilized and not fertilized eggs. It develops from the fertilized uh, uh, egg uh, it has deployed as we mentioned. Once it emerges, we'll speak about uh, competition between multiple queens because there are many queen cells uh, later on, but once it emerges, it will go for mating flights. And this is the only time queens leave colony, except later on for swarming. So for first, during first two weeks, it flies out, it mates with 10 to 20 drones. The more, the merrier. The more, the merrier. Why? Because we have sick bee here. If we have limited number of drone mating, it, the di genetic diversity is limited and the colony health will be compromised. And basically she accumulates the sperm from collected from these 20 drones during these two weeks in spermatica, a specialized organ that doesn't exist in mammalian species, but it does exist in veterinary medicine. And in veterinary medicine, spermatica is a liquid nitrogen tank with sperm that veterinarian is using for in, uh, artificial insemination of cows. Well, that's spermatica in queen, except that it is not liquid nitrogen. The sperm is alive. It is, when, we, when I say that to reproductive biologists, they are amazed that sperm could be alive for three to five years. And again, if there is not enough sperm, be held. We will not have enough workers. Workers are taking care of colonies. We will have disease. So once mated, queen will not leave colony anymore unless for swarming. And there are two major functions of the queen. We spoke about egg laying and pheromone production. Ivana, our PhD student will cover reproductive system of the queen and histology later on. And uh, hormonal production is very important uh, for well-being of colony. And these, these uh, pheromones are spread through the colony, through air and to direct contact prophylaxis, which is exchange of food between worker bees. So queen attend a queen has uh, bee attendants that collect uh, mandibular secretion and other secretion of the pheromones and spread them through colony and entire colony is functioning very well and in homeostasis if we have good queen and good genetic. These pheromones are suppressing development of worker bees into pseudo queens. So their, their hypoplastic ovaries are not going to be developing. They are happy to serve queen. Uh, and uh, the, these pheromones regulate health. So 
mandibular gland, and we know that uh, uh, mandibular gland is a very important secretion of the pheromones, but not the only organ because we have some excellent surgeons in, in Germany that excise these mandibular glands in clean and they can still maintain homeostasis because they have some other glands uh, that are discovered by these uh, uh, various uh, people that name them after like uh, Koshevniko and various other uh, glands secreting these. So pheromones are basically regulating many different functions of the colony. And wherever we have bees, sick bees, <clears throat> we have basically connection to disease. So guarding of the entrance, well, bees will be preventing drifting of bees and robber bees. And if we don't have enough population of these guardians, usually we don't have enough population because colony is sick, colony is sick, not enough guardians. We have strong colony will come and rob this sick colony and spread disease. Uh, brood care and hygiene, if it is not hygienic, have not removed uh, dead bees or not removed, but we have pathogens all over sick disease. Food supplies, if you don't have proper food supply, healthy pollen, polyflora pollen, you'll have disease. Swarming through the swarm, excessive swarming will also spread disease. And here is an example of a queen retinue. Attendant bees are always around her, providing her with food just to give, produce pheromones and lay eggs. And in this slide, we have some bonuses here. You can look at uh, these, this is pollen, and this is open honey, nectar, and for pathologies and veterinarians, here we have something here too. Here we have a varroa mite. So queens are uh, responsible and going to be replaced, whether guilty or not, if the brood pattern is not good, if cleanliness, hygiene is not good, if colony is too aggressive, if disease resistance is not good, or productivity. And this is the amazing part, because you take this queen, you destroy it, and you can purchase through the mail highly hygienic queen with good genetics. You put it in the hive, and within 40 a, uh, 42 days during the summer, when all worker bees originating from your previous queen die, the new worker bees will be replaced with new genetics and upgraded to highly productive homestain dairy cow. Imagine this magic tool to have in dairy, in poultry, in any other production. And here we have in big keeping production. So if we, this is nice regular brood uh, and this is shotgun or spotty brood and will cover these diseases. But if we have these first thing, queen is gone or you could have some other diseases there. Now drones. Drones are lazy drones. There is some, some, some uh, uh, international, international uh, uh, audience here, probably you have term lazy as drone, does nothing, just eats and want to have sex. And that's their main purpose. They are, the purpose is to mate with virgin queens, and it happens in flight, in the air. And for those in the audience that think that, wow, this is a beautiful life, wait for the next. If the drone is successful to mate, his endophilus is going to be ripped off and will go with queen and drone will die. Oops, I'm not sure that I want to be drone anymore. Uh, uh, so here it is. Additional things, first two weeks of the drone is basically sexual maturation. And once they are mature, they will go and during nice weather, usually early afternoon, 
drone congregation areas where queens are mated and they hang out there and they wait for, for queen, uh, virgin queens and they have these proportionally big eyes because, and they have extremely good smell to smell and notice these new virgin queens coming to mate with them. During the winter, they are not needed. And evolutionary surplus, as you know, evolution or whatever you believe, uh, intelligent design uh, is, is ruthless. If you are not useful, you're gone. So, however, they are important from honeybee disease point of view. Genetic diversity. Remember, we said a queen needs to have diverse genetic pool when they uh, when they mate with drones, uh, and because polyandry, polyandry, multiple uh, men uh, will increase the uh, genetic component of her sperm mixture in spermatica in that liquid nitrogen tank. And the second thing important is that drones have open doors in each hive versus worker bees in order to enter another hive can go, but it has to be bringing food, pollen or, or honey. Otherwise guard, proper guarded uh, colony will not allow them, but drones have open doors so they can spread, spread disease and uh, various diseases actually. This is fascinating. I don't know how they did it, but captured uh, mating in the air by camera. If you have time, watch this video, take picture by your phone of this link. And while you're taking picture, I'll just take a bit of it. Uh, Colby Klein dissected drone and studied drone reproductive tract. And I'm not going to be speaking about this a lot because Ivana later on is be, uh, will be speaking more about it. Workers, there are two types, two phenotypes of workers. Uh, both of them sterile females that have hypoplastic ovaries due to lack of proper royal jelly that was deprived and reserved only for queens. Everybody else got worker brood food and develops into worker. However, uh, 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 so they do all activities in the hives except reproduction. And those activities during the summer are plenty and they are varying off the worker population and they are living much shorter, only six weeks. So they are cleaning hives, nursing bees, social immunity. They, you can imagine them to be uh, 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 white blood cells, if you wish, macrophages. They go around and they clean. They are they're removing dead. Uh, they are also uh, uh, involved in, in the neck collection, building hive with wax. So that's why we have a, a sick bee here, because it is social immunity cleaning, dead removal. Sick bees here is also because workers will drift from colony to colony, specifically sick workers. Uh, like, uh, and we, we will see that with varroa infestation uh, when, when it comes back from the, from the with full stomach and uh, with, with the nectar, it will be allowed to another hive, but it could be bringing a disease. That's why we have sick bee. Uh, summer worker bees, as I mentioned, tremendous array of, of uh, duties there. And you can divide worker life into three weeks, three weeks, and three weeks. So three weeks we mentioned from egg to pupa and emergence, three weeks duties in hive, various duties, uh, cleaning, building, uh, immunity, feeding queen, and last three weeks of the life. So once they do service to the colony, 
they are expendable. They are sent to the most dangerous task to collect honey, uh, uh, nectar, and pollen, and propolis, and water. And if they are dead, colony already got out from them their useful, uh, 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 th their, their input because they cleaned hive and everything. If you wish, it's probably not popular comparison, but we can compare them to our residents in pathology. So initially we teach them and invest a lot, but later on we ask them to teach our senior students and we, re we get returned back from them, nasty senior pathologists. Okay, now let's move to winter worker. If I can summarize in one word, there is only one function of the winter workers. It is to protect queen and ensure that queen survives the winter. And they leave for uh, six months, five, five to six months because they are not worn by food, by, by, by feeding uh, uh, larvae and by uh, collection of the feed and resources flying. Uh, and it's very important that this winter population of workers are exposed to minimal amount of disease and they are not infected with viruses. That Varroa will speak about that later on is suppressed at least during the last brood cycle during the fall. So the winter bees are healthy and can carry the uh, uh, hive and protect the queen until next spring. Bees do not hibernate. They thermoregulate by making clusters uh, condense and uh, if it is cold or slightly spread if it is warmer. And they do not defecate entire winter or they can go for cleansing flights only a few times a winter in our region when there is sunny uh, break a bit. And we have many sick bees here that covered what I just said here. So here is basically winter cluster, very close, tight, uh, packed in order to preserve energy. Here is just regular summer uh, bees uh, uh, when you open them. And how does this cluster survive? This is a nice slide prepared by Sarah Wood. She'll be presenting later on. In the center of the cluster, there is around a 90, a 29 Celsius uh, in Fahrenheit is slightly different. And how do they keep these? They vibrate with their muscle, contraction uh, thoracic muscle. They are not uh, uh, fanning wings, but they are just contracting muscle. This produce the, the heat and uh, they are exchanging places with periphery. And uh, so basically they are constantly rotating so the cold bees go and heat and uh, this, and, and uh, heated bees go to the cold. With this, we finished a review of biology of pests. Now we'll just cover a bit uh, more about beekeeping. So uh, we spoke about winter and mortality over the winter has raised significantly in North America. And this 15% used to be an acceptable mortality rate. In Canada now, it ranges between 20 and 30, 40%. In United States, it's even worse. This uh, darker bar indicates acceptable mortality. And these lighter bars later years indicates total mortality, winter and summer versus middle bar indicate winter mortality. And as we can see, uh, the mortality exceeds accepted mortality and ex accepted mortality. So how can we can, how can beekeepers make money and enough money to pay even veterinarians for their diagnostic and prescription of drugs? Well, and with especially with these tremendous losses, 30, 25 to 
event, uh, 35 annual mortality. Can you imagine any other an, uh, animal industry, food producing industry that loses? Uh, how do they manage it? They manage it through the specific artificial reproduction. We'll cover one aspect of the briefly that exploits this extreme efficiency of social aspect of honeybee superorganism. But before we go and explain that, we need to understand normal. So normal reproduction of honeybee for century, for, century, for millennia involved swarming and swarming is natural reproduction. So what happens if the colony is very big, crowded, the queen pheromones don't go all around and, and, and uh, it will be predisposed to swarming, crowded, swarm cells will be produced young, young uh, replacement queens. And when these young replacement queens are in the pupil stage, capped, they will, uh, the old queen will leave colony with 50% of worker bees. And uh, here it is, so early stage crowded colony, bearded, we, we have uh, a basically hanging. It doesn't mean that uh, when we see this, it's always sign of the swarming, but we better check. And if there are queen cells, uh, swarming queen cells, and when we say swarming queen cells, we mean those cells along the periphery of the frame, usually at the bottom of the frame, or right on the top or the periphery of the frame. And swarming queen cells are like this peanut, hanging peanut, vertical. Drone cells and worker cells are horizontal with the ground, versus queen cells are pen perpendicular to ground. And when we, this, this is more or less the stage when queen cells are capped, plenty numerous. The uh, queen takes half of population, sometimes more, uh, and leaves the hive, and there are two parts of swarming. First part, within 100 uh, meters of the original hive, it will land somewhere on the, on the branch, and within 24 hours or earlier, uh, earlier than 24, the scout bees are going to go all over, 10 kilometers around, looking for the best cavities, and they will come back they will try to convince colony which, which uh, uh, place is the best and democracy, whoever wins or multiple scouts are uh, pointing towards the same colony will leave up to 10 kilometers and into a new cavity. And this is the time when capturing of the swarm is happening. And for millennia, that was the way to reproduce the queen. Sometimes during this swarming period that is in our region, late May and June, kids 100 years ago would be placed in front of the colony, watch them when they're swarming and there are certain signs of swarming and kids would run, bring the parents and uh, uh, parents would catch the swarm. If you don't catch the swarm, uh, the harvesting of swarm will be very difficult because they will go into some kind of three cavities or, or wars into various spaces of inhabited uh, houses. This happened to be a roof with multiple layers of the comb. And there are sometimes horror stories dripping honey from the from the ceiling, and this is a big nuisance. What happened with these queen cells that are left behind in the colony? So we have this old, uh, the, the, the half of the colony left with old queen. Here we have new queen. So virgin queen will exit here. And if there are multiple exiting at the same time, they will be fighting, fighting to death and the fittest will survive. The fit survival of fittest, evolutionary. It's actually a very important part. And later on, this uh, victor winner will go around and destroy all these remaining queens. And you know that it's destroyed by queen because it's open on the side. 
not open on the top. And within two weeks, it will go into mating flights, and majority of the mating flights will happen during between two and three kilometers, but another half will happen uh, seven and a half kilometer radius, but it could happen even fur much further. As we mentioned, sperm collected here last for life. So now there are three different queen cells that we use for determination of the health status of the colony. First one are swarming cells. We, we covered it. It's a crowded colony at the bottom of the frame. Another two queen cells are very similar. They are built at the face of the frame and they are originating from the brood, from the worker brood, for, from the early larvae of the worker brood. And first type of the cells are supersedure cells. This queen is underperforming for whatever reason. It could be old queen, doesn't have enough uh, egg, uh, uh, sperm, so it starts to lay more drones, failing, failing, uh, failing queen, and uh, bees sense it and start to build these supersedure queen cells. Another queen cells are emergency queen cells. Again, very similar distribution. However, uh, in emergency queen cell, we don't see queen because it's dead. It's either killed by beekeeping practices or something happened to her. And so in three days after that, we will not see eggs anymore because egg will be for three days and after that emerge larvae. So after three days, we shouldn't see any eggs, but we will see emergence larvae and, and similar age as the youngest larvae will be these uh, queen cells. So those are emergence. And, and we use those for examination of hives. It's very important to determine the status. We'll cover that later on, specifically in the failing queen. So swarm is obviously very detrimental. We don't want to lose half of herd. <clears throat> of, uh, so uh, there are many various different practices of multiplying of the queens and getting nucleus as well as managing the swarms. And the most important is to keep young queens and give appropriate space to, to the colony. So now we will go these uh, multiple uh, colony uh, uh, techniques for multiplication of the colony and it's associated with, with uh, sick bees. Oops, this is not good. Okay, let's hope like that. Uh, so here is one of one type of replication of the colonies. Uh, here is our our apiary. Uh, we, uh, we 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 choose the best queen, the best genetics, and we take from her early larvae. And the early larvae is just hatched, so just hatched. And we have a special tool and we transfer these larvae in queen caps, which are called, this is called uh, uh, transferring or uh, uh, grafting, but in, in veterinary medicine, it could be used embryo transfer. And if we want, and, and, and we have these around 90, 92 of these frames, 90 queens here, 90 larvae, potential larvae from the worker bees and we make an artificial queenless colony that is over flooded with young bees and we remove all open brood from there. So we leave them like that for 24 hours and they, got, they become bazookas, they are crazy. Wow, we are so strong, we don't have young, young replacement uh, for emergency replacement queen, because you removed all the all eggs, all young larvae, and after that you insert your 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 grafted or embryo transfer frames, and they're accepted. And within uh, ten days or so, 
you are ready to have a lot of queen cells. And these queen cells are artif uh, artificially produced. We can split the colony, strong colony, in multiple replacement heifers. And what we need there, we need one honey frame, one pollen or empty, and two brood, cap brood or whatever with, with some bees there. We insert these and basically this is artificial swarm because once we have emerged bees, uh, queen bees from here, we will have uh, basically this queen, virgin queen for first two weeks will go and fly and mate and establish this colony as this swarm, uh, 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 after post swarming hives that is, that is left there. The trouble there is a bit different here from the, from the disease point of view. Uh, well, actually, before we go there, uh, let's just uh, don't, don't go into disease yet, okay? So I showed you a bit what we do, but at the commercial level, here is what's done. All of these small boxes are these small mating nukes that have a handful, well, not handful, that, that they have whatever, uh, 100, 100 grams to half a, half a uh, kilo to one pound of bees, depending, sometimes bigger, but uh, if it is high commercial, it will be smaller nuke. And each of them have inserted queen cells and these, these hundreds of nukes here will be uh, uh, queens emerging and mating uh, and, and competing for drones. So, so very important is that we would have drone source in this, in this uh, mating nuke, and it would, should be abundant and it should be genetically diverse. And after queens are mated, we uh, can put them in cages with a few attendant bees and a bit of uh, sugar uh, source, some putty, and they can survive for a couple of weeks of, like that we pack them and we can ship them all over the world. And there are uh, specifically this production are in California, in Haiti, Chile, and other warm, warm uh, uh, air, geographical areas. And they export these bees to more temperate climates. So for example, Canada is porti uh, importing over 200,000 queens and we have total 700 colonies. So almost one third of, queen, uh, of the colonies are replaced, uh, queens are replaced in this uh, uh, total population of, honey, uh, of the Canadian bees. It wouldn't be anything bad, but from the veterinary perspective, from the health perspective, there are some issues. And here are the issues. We, if we select the best queen, we can get enormous amount of queen from it. So basically we may have restricted pool, <clears throat> genetic pool of queen lines. Remember what we said? We had multiple queen cells there. We are, in, however, in our in our uh, artificial reproduction, we are inserting only queen cells. So there is no survival of the fetus and competition. Uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't exist there. The potential limited diversity of drones. If we have hundreds of, of mating nukes, nukes there, we have to make sure that we have great diversity of drones. However, uh, uh, these Queen producers, if you consider world population of bees, there are not too many. So there is limited amount of genetic pool that we are narrowing and narrowing and narrowing each year and each year. In addition, stress of transportation and shipment of the queens was shown that it has affects viability of the sperm that is present in this liquid nitrogen tank it is called spermatica. So all of these things is associated with, with 
potentially suboptimal queens. And when we look, so on one side, this artificial reproduction with this efficient exploitation of the social insect characteristics of the superorganism, we are able to replace 35 to 45% losses, annual losses, but at the same time, we are entering a vicious cycle because the queens that we are producing may be suboptimal. And one of the major stressors that are considered to be contributing to the loss of the uh, honeybee mortality are con is considered to be poor quality of queens right at the uh, in par with pathogen parasites and pests pesticides exposure poor nutrition <clears throat> due to loss of habitat and monoculture reduced genetic diversity as we explained through this uh, 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 rather restricted uh, queen breeding uh, breeding uh, programs and managing practices, transportation, pollinator, uh, migrating, we'll, we'll cover that later on. The importance of this and order will depends on the person, uh, uh, scientist uh, is deb debatable, uh, whether, uh, and also on the regional uh, geographical regions. Now, let's go closer to home. So, so far, I suspect if you were a veterinarian without background, I hope, I sincerely hope that you were hopefully looking and listening to uh, National Geographic and wondering about these species. Right now, we are going closer to the to home diseases. So transmission of diseases within the colony and between the colonies. So within the colony, it's no brainer for veterinarians to understand that if you have 80,000 80, uh, of, of individual within whatever 40, 80 liters of the cavity uh, uh, or 80 uh, cubic decimeters, uh, I, I'm not going to be mixing imperial, and but you know the space of the hive, that transmission will be very, very efficient. If you add to that trophylaxis, which is exchange of food. So imagine now having a stadium of people watching whatever your favorite sport, several thousands there, and each of them eating a hamburger, but not swallowing it, chewing it, and exchanging this food with your neighbor and by the end of the game, you have uh, the same microbiome spread of disease that is involved in bees with spreading of pheromones and necessary for that. And honeybee duties, removal of that, uh, and nursing of brood will spread all of these inside the colony. In addition, we have evidence of uh, or a vertical transmission, viruses, and potentially some other pathogens. So now transmission between the colonies is the same. Very easy for us veterinarians. We have crowded environment. We have what a few uh, a, a few hundred uh, feet, and on these few hundred he, feet, we put two million bees. And these bees, we have drones that are drifting from colony to colony, and we, we have weak colony robbing and uh, transmitting of disease. So drones and worker drifting, foragers foraging on the same uh, flowers in the same areas. There is evidence that some viruses could be transmitted like that. Queen mating within, with infected drones, colony swarming, also transmitting disease. However, surprisingly, all of these are probably minority. The majority for trans natural transmission is robbing. And robbing, basically, we have a weak colony. We have a sick colony first. Sick colony will have depleted population. 
depleted population will have depleted uh, uh, or reduced guarding bees. So these bees cannot expel invaders. So they are overwhelmed by the healthy, strong colonies and they're robbed. And by robbing resources, honey, pollen, these resources are infected because it's weak colony and sick colony, and they are bringing these pathogens back into healthy colony and spreading. And if you wondered so far how amazing evolution or whatever intellectual design is with these honeybees, you're right. But there is this evolutionary design mistake robbing that actually is amazing and i still didn't figure out why it exists but uh, anyway it is there so we cover that okay so sick uh, weak colony will be overwhelmed and foragers from the strong colony will be stealing resources and bringing infectious material into health colony so this is robbing most most important disease spread natural disease spread among the colonies. However, it is not most important transmitter of disease in honeybees. The most important, so this is basically robbing, sorry. Uh, uh, so uh, you can see that uh, this colony is overwhelmed by var it, uh, through various openings, bees are coming here and there will be a lot of dead bees of fight at least initially. There may be uh, crumbling uh, uh, bee wax because they will be opening sealed resources and stealing. But uh, let's go back. The most important transmission of disease in anthropogenic. So humans are the most important spreader of disease through mixing of the contaminate uh, fomites, sale, and purchase of disease. If they are not inspected, so make sure that you advise beekeepers to buy or beginner beekeepers to buy inspected colony make sure that they have certificate provided by uh, uh, provincial or state apiarist apiculturist inspectors whatever they're called depending on the geography and trade and global globalization we saw and will see more and more uh example with the next presentations we mentioned today varroa invaded came came in 1987 we'll mention uh, north america we'll speak more about that nozima apis came uh, tracheal mites came from united states to canada it came from europe to united states so and after that we have migratory beekeeping and migratory beekeeping is a very, very important contribution to agriculture, but at the same time, it is a sword with two edges. And the second edge is transmission of diseases. And you, <clears throat> from your veterinary uh, and epidemiology, you know that this migratory beekeeping is not good. Why? because we are taking bees to the highly populated monoculture. So diversity of the food is, is uh, limited. Transportation stress. In, in uh, uh, animal medicine, we have shipping fever in cows, pneumonia connected to transportation. Here we, a big, and we are transporting them only once in their life. When we win them from the, their cow cow operation and we put them into the feedlot, we have to give them long term antibiotics in, in order to prevent the shipping fever or vaccinate them. And yet we are doing that every year to two thirds of colonies in the United States, transporting them not only once, but to, to almonds, to apple in Washington, to almonds in California, apples in Washington, 
eastern side for uh, uh, East United States. Mixing of animals in the small area and intense agriculture is associated with intense agrochemicals, fungicides, insecticides. So if you think about it, it's wonder how can be even bees even survive? How can the rest of 60% survive? It's no wonder that 40 dies or 30, but how the other are surviving? Well, answer is super organism, efficiency, social insect. Okay, so migratory pollinators, almond in California, one over 1 million of acres. It is concentrated on 70 by 70 kilometers in miles, whatever it would be, 50 by 50 miles. During the two weeks of bloom, we put 1.7 million of hives, two thirds to three quarters of United States commercial beehives. Why? Because it is a good income. The uh, pollination services price went skyrocketed contrary to decline of the population because almonds depend 100% on the pollination of honeybees. Cherries, blueberries, very high. Apples in, in Washington, Washington state, any of these. In Canada, we are a bit less reliant on migratory beekeeping. Only 15% of total population will uh, of 750 hives are migratory that be that are used for hybrid canola, blueberry pollination, and some other fruit pollination. Let's speak about honeybee immunity. And, and actually, this is the answer why these 60% of bees are able to survive. If they were relying as rest of mammalian species on only individual immunity, they would be extinct, I suspect. The cellular immunity and humoral immunity, hemocytes, and however, they have additional social immunity, hygienic behavior. If they sense the disease, their individual cell go there around, remove and macrophages, grooming, Cleanly, cleaning of the hive, propolis collection. They go around, they collect raisins, and it's been shown that selective collection of raisins will be collected in bees affected by different pathogens. It's fascinating. So here is example of uh, hygienic behavior. Here we have on one side varroa. So basically we have a honeybee queen laying eggs, larvae development, and just before capping, we have female varroa going here and multiplying under the capping, protected from the bees. They don't see it. However, our neutrophils and macrophages, our hygienic bees, there are two phenotypes of them. One can sense something is abnormal. There, remember those uh, uh, pattern recognition pattern, FCA, uh, uh, MCH1, MCH2 in, in immunology. Well, it's not like that, but very similar. They go, they sense it, something is wrong and they will mark it. They will open it, make a hole equivalent to opsonins. Opsonins will be opsonizing a part of cell. And the, macrophage will come there and take this sick bee larva or pupa in this particular case or prepupa, remove it and hopefully before spreading or before developing of the uh, mature replace uh, 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 mated, mated uh, varroa or hopefully before formation of the spore in American fall brood, et cetera amazing tool of the social immunity. Grooming, 
removal of each other of, of, of the Baroa. Take picture of this fascinating video. We don't have time to watch it. Uh, however, uh, we use these in order to improve genetic resistance of these. And how do we do it? We can measure it. Here is example. Uh, this is not the best slide, but anyway, I'll use it. I'm missing one here, but uh, one, one image. But in, uh, here it is. Imagine this one here. Okay, so this is the normal healthy brood, okay? And on top, we put a pipe, hollow pipe on both sides and insert it right here. You can see grew and we pour liquid nitrogen on top and we kill these, these larvae and these are alive. And after that, we, rem we put this frame into the hive, into back into hive and go 24 hours after that. And we count how many of uh, uh, dead bees were removed versus how many are uh, still there. And these, for example, here we have that are still there that these don't re didn't remove. And here is basically uh, almost 100% removed. So this hive is much higher genetics, uh, hygiene, uh, uh, has hygiene genetic than this Y one. And we would select this queen for disease resistance. So we would take this queen and multiply it in this in these numerous bees, uh, 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 daughter queens, virgin queens that will be fertilized, um, mated, hopefully by disease resistance. But we can overdo on that, and we'll cover that later on. But still, very important to have hygienic. So now let's veterinarians, a majority, or not majority, but substantial of our income come for vaccination. Cannot we discover a vaccine for these bees and just sell vaccines instead of antibiotics? We don't have a high, high income on antibiotics. Well, from somewhere first year of immunology in vet school, you probably remember that vertebrates have two arms of immunity, innate immunity and acquired immunity. And <clears throat> this acquired immunity came with vertebra. And it is basically where we have these lymphocytes and memory cells. And more advanced or higher ladder of, of, of vertebrates, higher efficiency of vaccination in birds and mammals versus lower on the ladder of the vertebrates fish, efficiency of vaccination is lower but still is there and be vaccinated. However, in the rest of the animal kingdom, we don't have acquired immunity. Therefore, we do not have the narrow definition of vaccination. Some of you who are reading this uh, uh, multi, uh, 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 media, uh, uh, you saw probably articles about uh, vaccines against American fowl brood being developed in Scandinavian countries or Europe. Well, these are not necessarily vaccines. Those are in a way uh, uh, priming, they're, they're priming uh, this innate immunity, that innate immunity is constantly activated. We have, I worked on my PhD on fish. So some vaccines in fish, with oil based, we inject them into the peritoneal cavity and they cause chronic inflammation and they are upregulating innate immunity. And in part, they are protecting this, this fish against the infection together with acquired immunity, but is, which is not as strong as some other higher species. So, so vaccination per se, in bees doesn't exist. Okay, so let's just continue with treatment and prevention of bees. And how do we do it? And I'll just go very quickly here because we will be covering this in other segments of this presentation. Obviously, we don't inject the individual bees. Majority of the treatment will come through food. 
However, before administration of chemical treatment in honeybee industry, the, the, the state apiculturist and, and, and the provincial apiculturists who are responsible for the management of health, they use term integrated pest management. You don't use it as often in, in veterinary medicine. And there are many different, but the, but the tools that are used are exactly the same as in veterinary medicine. Genetic selection, we mentioned it. Uh, uh, inspection, maintenance of the strong colonies, prevention of the robbing and spread disease, destruction of the infected colony, replacement of the frames we'll be speaking about. So all of these is important first. And if those are failing, then we go into chemical control. And chemical control, we have uh, a parasite or miticide, fungicide, antibiotics. The problem is that we have resistant development in these in these animal species in these pathogens, and due to these resistance in human medicine, we have this FDA and Canada mandated. Uh, veterinary oversight of antimicrobials, important in human medicine to be uh, regulated. And that's why veterinary medicine in North America started to be involved in honeybees, honeybees uh, uh, and prescription. In other, uh, in some other countries, in European countries, veterinarians and, and like the act was always under veterinary act. North America, B Act is under Veterinary Act only in the province of Quebec because it's it's structured based on French legislation or whatever. The rest can, uh, states and provinces in North America are from the uh, 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 in Canada and the United States. When I say North America. I know that Mexico is also there, but somehow, sorry, Mexico, I'm not excluding you, but uh, I, I, I refer to Canada and, and, and United States, is uh, uh, created according to UK, and it, it's uh, B Act is under the Plant Act uh, in most cases, but it's being changed with this uh, uh, FDA and Health Canada. Anyway, I'm, I spent too much time here. Veterinarians are responsible for antibiotic prescription. Uh, we do have some antifungal uh, uh, that are not approved in the United States, but approved in Canada. And in some other jurisdictions, veterinarians are also responsible for antivaroa drugs, but not in North America. So how do we apply this treatment? Well, uh, as I mentioned, not through injection, but through feed administration. So we try to give them either through the syrup <clears throat> or through the sugar, uh, sugar uh, mixed with antibiotics or active substance, or through the contacts specifically for the ectoparasites that we have active substance impregnated in the, in the plastic or through the evaporation uh, uh, of the of this this active substance. So uh, when it comes to administration of the therapy, uh, I don't need to say that to veterinarians, but I'm telling that to veterinarians to impose and encourage beekeepers to read la a label before using and 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 make sure follow label. I see that I have only one minute left. I will finish this section and rest, I will move for the following section. So uh, here is the, uh, read the label. The most important thing that you apply proper dose, proper time, proper withdrawal. Don't, so, so you don't treat hives during the honey collection. Like it's the same if you treat mastitis, you don't take this milk into the common collection area uh, uh, and uh, uh, make sure that you rot rotate ingredient drug, active drug ingredients so you decrease re and reduce resistance. Okay, so just quick 
how do we apply? I will be a couple minutes longer, Rafaela, just to finish this section. So how do we apply drugs? Uh, we apply through the feed, and here it is uh, during the fall. Uh, as I mentioned before, we remove honey and only brood chamber is two brood chambers are left. We are giving them abundance of food. And in this particular case, we put Nozema treatment fumagillin. Remember, fumagillin is not approved in, in United States. Yeah, I alarm here for two hours, few more minutes. Okay. Uh, good. Okay, so they are applied through food. Similar could be applied oxytetracycline in, in, in syrup approved in North America, uh, AFB and EF uh, against AFB and EFB. However, I don't recommend it. It's much better to apply it through the powder. Mix, mixing and Mike will tell you exactly how to do it uh, and apply away from the brood. Brood is here because this could be toxic for brood. Another way of applying is through the vapor formic acid. You dip meat, meat pads or absorbent paper into formic acid, place it on top and, and, and uh, uh, evaporation will kill varroa. It will kill bees too, because we are looking for a healthy balance between the, uh, because we are killing arthropods on arthropods. So, but the most important individual that we don't want to kill is queen. And sometimes we do see queen mortality with, uh, with, with some of those treatments. So oxalic acid by dribble or oxalic acid by sublimation and evaporation for varroa, so formic acid and oxalic acid, or this impregnate, impregnated plastic or some other material that we put, like in this particular apivar with amitraz and low dose amitraz will kill varroa, but not, uh, not necessarily be toxic to bees. Here I'll stop. Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't have, I don't have a lot of time for questions. Those of you who need to go for a break are welcome and I'll be opening my Q and A panel and I'll answer a few questions uh, 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 or uh, Rafaela, please let me know how, how to deal it. Do you have, do you priori prioritize any of those? You can start uh, at the top and okay. go answering it. What is the smoke that, uh, what what is in smoke that calms the bees down? Well, actually, we don't really know exact the mechanism. There are two ways. Uh, one is that uh, the smell of the smoke will interfere with the alarm chemicals, spread of alarm chemicals. We are attacked. So, so the bees are not going to be informed. That, uh, that these guardian bees, that they are under attack. The second thing is also valid. If you smoke hive, what you can see, you can see individual worker bees are going to be open uh, cells and eating and engorging themselves with honey into the proventricles because potentially anthropologically thinking, they are thinking that hive is potentially going to be burning and we need to escape, let's just re secure as much resources. And, their expanded abdomen, they cannot post, make a posture that they're uh, going to be injecting the venom. It's similar to uh, urination posture with the, with, the, with the animals when they cannot make it due to CN, uh, spinal cord injury, similar to here, okay? So that's one. Next question. Yes. Uh, all examples are box hives, uh, uh, the flow hive, flow hive. Yeah, these guys are very successful, uh, very successful marketing and flow hive will not work in our area or in prairies that because we have honey that crystallized within two to three weeks of collection. And if you have crystallized honey in flow hive, it will not flow out. Some other geographic regions that have lower crystallization rate would work. You're right. And not only on box, 
box types, but I, I present only Langstroth box. We are not presenting other dundant dun, dun, uh, 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 top bar or whatever, because Langstroth are probably the best, at least in North America, worldwide for commercial presentation. Yeah, uh, Canada is coming back. Why is it different in the United States? Well, I have to be very politically correct here, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I suspect one thing maybe that 70, uh, uh, 66 to 75% of colonies are migratory in, in, in United States. So we have melting box in transmitting of diseases and and 75% are exposed to this intense migratory rotation, uh, migratory uh, pollination versus in Canada, we have only 15%. That would be probably uh, uh, the only one. Uh, th there may be geographical regions too. Okay, next one. Okay, uh, uh, use of sugar water for feeding for feeding bees at the end of the of the uh, uh, season. So we steal honey from bees, but we feed it with with sugar, uh, with sugar water. Why we do it? Well, sugar is much cheaper. Actually, corn syrup is even more cheaper, uh, and 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 basically that's commercial. It's 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 uh, making a buck. Would it be better to leave honey? It depends the origin of the honey. If honey is highly contaminated with, with pesticides, it would not be better. And some honey uh, um, have high, high solid component. For example, uh, honeydew honey is not good for overwintering because they will fill the bees guts and they cannot go empty uh, cleansing hives. So, so while sugar honey, seems to be uh, unfair that we steal honey from uh, uh, sugar, sugar uh, water, unfair that we steal honey from bees and we give them sugar water. What is actually very important that bees have natural pollen. That's the majority of the vitamins, uh, minerals, and, and various other things that come. Sh honey is predominantly used as energy source and sugar is effic efficiently used uh, sucrose specifically for, for energy. Corn syrup, there are some study by, by uh, Dr. Curry, just recent study from uh, Winnipeg, Winnipeg, compared corn and sugar, and sometimes there is difference, uh, uh, noticeable difference. Next question. Uh, if a hive has to be moved several meters on a property, how can we do it properly? Uh, move it a few meters a time, a few meters every few days. In that case, you can you can do it, but you cannot move it 100, 100 uh, meters at the same time. What role of veterinarians have to play in the treatment of management bees given the abundance of the evidence demonstrating they are direct threat to wild pollinators populations via spillover of disease especially viruses. This is also loaded question, okay? Wild pollinators versus manage, manage, poly, manage pollinators, okay? Uh, uh, there is no question that there is some evidence of competition. There is some scientific evidence of, of, of pathogen uh, spillover, but not necessarily that we have a lot of evidence for that is a big impact. So science is still being done uh, and uh, uh, against without honeybees pollination, wild pollinators will, will, will not be enough. Okay, I'm uh, uh, guessing they're investigating what exactly in royal jelly or brood meal makes egg develop worker to queen. Yes, uh, royal jelly has much higher uh, uh, much higher uh, protein and, and lipid and, and other nu nutrient uh, substances. Probably there are pheromones, and, but I am not the expert in that area. Does the genetic of worker bees 
uh, in a high bar given that we make uh, with several drones. Excellent question. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have some subpopulation of, of honeybees there that uh, it is variable. And some of them will be much better and efficient cleaners. Some of them will be much better and efficient pollen collectors. Some of them will be much more efficient uh, uh, propolis collectors. Yes, excellent question. And if we don't have this diversity, uh, uh, the uh, honeybee is not going to be as healthy. Okay, next question. Have we been able to locate the congregation area of mate mating? Yes, there are some people who are able to, to, to go to the field and they can pick the congregation area. You can even notice them. Just do Google search and congregation areas. So sometimes you can see those, those there, okay. In tropical area, drones are not expelled right, right? Uh, there's no winter, N uh, not necessarily. Uh, uh, there is no winter, but there are, there are dry periods. There is no fooding, uh, food forage and uh, drone population would be decreased, both uh, drone, uh, drone, uh, uh, drone brood as well as adult brood. Uh, do bee get too hot when, the air, when they are wrapped uh, for winter and we get a warm spell with the temperature over uh, zero Celsius. Not in our regions. Uh, up to up, uh, they will not. Uh, they we still leave. We'll speak about that. We still leave two entrances open, top and bottom, so there is ventilation to it. Uh, when we are uh, bearding in the preparation to swarm, is the queen inside? the beard or still in the hive, still in the hive. The uh, outside are only workers uh, trying to cool off, cool off colony. Uh, do we know why we built uh, supersedure cells on the face of the framework versus queen cells uh, uh, on the edge? Yes, absolutely. So when colony is preparing for the swarm, if the entire colony is ready for preparation, so they will designate the periphery for the cell uh, building of the queen uh, of the cell. So it's premeditated building of the swarm cells. However, in the supersedure cells, colony is not strong or in emergency cells when we don't have any more queen. So bees are looking for any suitable egg. And in this particular case, it's a worker egg that is deployed egg uh, that will be raised into a queen. What is the best way to disinfect a colony? Well, it depends what you're doing. We'll be covering that later on in various diseases. Uh, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll pass that one. Are, are many packages, uh, how are we doing the time? Okay, only a couple more questions because I have here replacement of people that are waiting and will need to load their presentation. Are many packages uh, sourced from bees that have been used for commercial pollination? If so, are we exporting not healthy bees to people who buy packages for their apiaries? Well, again, uh, loaded question. Uh, it, if we buy packages from New Zealand, they come from the end season, yeah? End of their summer season, beginning of our season. If we buy packages from somewhere else, uh, they come from the hot regions uh, to temperate, not accommodated. Uh, the, the, the wisdom, common wisdom is that we would use, it's best to raise queens in area where you beekeep, you multiply bees in area where you beekeep, uh, where you do beekeeping. Okay, uh, how about last question? Do you have any information about or know of any instances of pathogen, Nozema, deformed wing virus spill over from honeybees to either manage bumblebees or wild bees population in Canada or Northern USA. I, I, don't have, I don't have it on top of my head, but I know that people are studying it and it's easily able to find. I'm not sure whether it's documented uh, well as epidemiological studies, but the bigger concern there, if there is any, we have invasive, invasive bumblebee 
pollinators also that are have an in wild that have not been present previously on the western coast okay thank you very much uh, for your interests